Hello, welcome to the 19th century barn build. I'll be going over all the materials that I use in this build and the techniques that I use to make it. It is 100% styrene. The four walls, front, back, rear, and two sides are 30 thou styrene sheets. The roof is a double layer of 20 thou and 10 thou. Here I'm cutting the sheet for the front of the barn. I don't cut all the way through anything bigger than uh, 20 thou. I'll score it and snap it. Usually the first pass I make with the razor is just a very light uh, mark. And then I go through and I make another. So the uh, knife has something to follow. And then usually the third one, if it's something intricate like this, then I'll push the knife through and then snap it out at the, at the edge. Always use a sharp hobby knife, new blade for new project is a good rule of thumb. So the only side that has any details is, is the front of the barn. I didn't put any windows in. I was trying to keep this a simple build. This build is for a friend of mine who wanted, who just got into the hobby and wanted to start scratch building. And I wanted to give him something that he could look at and um, see the materials that I used and the techniques. So that's what, what this is for. So here I am cutting the door, the barn door, and a little side door. My inspiration for this was uh, barns that I've seen. I think if you ever have been or grew up in a rural area uh, with farms or ranches, there's always some old barn that's completely dilapidated and falling down. And I wanted it to be structurally sound, but very rough, rough shape. I, I like that old look, worn out wood, bleached wood, rust that type of thing. And I will be making a base for this to sit on, which I will do a follow-up video for. But right now we're just gonna focus on the barn build. Now I'm scoring the, the lines for the door. So what I do is I cut through the left and the right side, the vertical cuts. And then the horizontal cut for the top of the door, I just score and snap. That usually gives a pretty clean cut. I was trying to make a barn that was 25 foot by 35 foot. And about 20 two feet high, I think is what it is at, at the eve. At that point, I was just trying to get the angle right so it looked right, um, rather than an actual specific height. So next, I start to plank the front. I wanted to make uneven boards, boards that looked like they came out of a sawmill in the 1800s or so, that were different shapes and sizes. I measured out roughly uh, 10 by 12, 10 by 10, 10 foot by 12 inch, 10 by 10 inch. Um, so here I am creating some grains in some 20 thou plastic with a saw, just grabbing the teeth and then I'll take a piece of sandpaper and kind of rough it out, smooth it out a little bit. So I have the grains, but it's not, the saw will, will is a little jagged. So I kind of tone that down a little bit with some sandpaper. The old sawmills, they would just uh, grind a log. So, you know, the, the center boards were always wider than the, the outer boards. And a lot of them were, were rough. It's what didn't have lows or a place like that to go to, you know, they just went to the mill, I guess. Then I kind of measured out the 10 by 12. So what I did was I, I took a piece and I, I scored half of it so I could get double amount of planks. So after I score it this way, then I'll snap it in half and then I'll have my roughly 10 foot boards and then I'll cut those out. But this was a, saved me a step. So I'm doing it, the, twice as many boards. 
And again, I'm not measuring this. I just took a rough, like a basic snapshot of what it would, the size would be. And I want uneven sizes. And I want the gaps. That was the whole reason for doing this um, on top of layering the 20 thou boards on top of a piece of 30 thou, obviously for rigidity, but also to, um, I wanted that uneven. I wanted spaces between the pieces of wood. So then I start to cut the, um, the strips, as you can see, I, I, at first I was just doing individual strips, but in, in order to uh, speed it up a little bit, I actually went to, was doing two and three boards at a time, which still gave me the space and the look I wanted. So I was okay with that. And this is time consuming, but you, once you start going it, you know what, you can go, go through it pretty quick. I did this on a live stream yesterday, board by board. I did the uh, facade of the of the barn. So this is the side, front side or back side. I don't remember which one. Um, but if you care to see me doing the the front, it's it's on a video in, in my live my live stream. So I, I left a little bit of overhang on the bottom so I could get an even cut. And in the top, I just I just cap with a strip. So I just run boards down the top. That'll be, um, there's a little bit of overhang on the roof. So there you can see the front, the back, and the sides are finished. Then I took some angle. You can use any size you want, depending on the size of the building you're making. And I cut a three quarter inch piece. Well, I actually cut four of them. And this is how I, um, put the, the four sides together. So on the inside corner, I put that angle piece in there and I just glue it in. And that's that's sufficient. The roof will, will kind of seal it up and make it rigid. So then I made some little hinges and what I did was I took some uh, 10 thou and I cut uh, some strips, maybe a, a millimeter wide, I guess, maybe two millimeter, I don't know, very thin. And then I, I cut a, a six strips for the barn door and three strips for the little side door. This is where it gets a little, little monotonous, a little freaky, but this was the look that I was going for. I wanted old, big, rusty hinges. And then I glue that in place. So I, I bowed the door, but I didn't cut all the way through it. I, I did cut after I, I put every, everything in there. I put a um, few little strips of 10 thou on the back to hold the door in place. So it wasn't just held by the hinges. So there's there's actually a, um, a little support piece on the back. I didn't show that, but so right behind the door and the wall, it's held on by 10 thou as well. And then I cut the piece in half after I mounted it, rather than hang two, two sides. And this is where it starts to get really stupid. So I took the smallest rod that I have and I started to cut these little, this was a trick that I learned watching the, the Great Wizard. And um, you're just cutting little nips of, of this rod, tiny little pieces. So this is gonna act as the hinge or the, wherever the little uh, bolt goes on the hinge. A little bit tedious and a little bit of uh, insanity with modeling here, but to get the, the look and result, you kind of got to go through this. So make extra because these things bounce all over the place and you pick them up and you drop them. And it's, they're tiny. So best way to do that is to uh, put some glue down. So I put a little bit of glue on the hinges. And if you get it centered right over the... Um, the crack in the door where the hinge goes, then you can take your th thumb and thumbnail and push it into the crack and then it recesses a little bit and it looks better than just a big round thing sitting on top. It actually looks, because the 10th thou will be, will be flexible at this point, especially when you saturate it with the, with the cement. You can kind of see where I'm going with this. So once you get it centered, you can kind of push it in there Otherwise, it doesn't look right if it's sitting on top. It's a little too big, but they don't make any any smaller rod that I know of. Yeah, see, so pick it up with your knife and then 
put some glue in it. It should stick there. You might have to move it around a little bit. Um, and you got to get it right in the center. But if you get it right over the, the, the crack there, then you can push it through. And it, it looks much better. A little bit more subdued. So it's starting to come together and this gives you a good angle. You can kind of see the space between the boards. So the goal is it, when it gets painted, it'll all get painted black and then it'll work out from there. So the cracks will still have the black paint in it. You'll see when it's, when it's finally done. So then I sheeted the roof with 20 thou, which was slightly sloppy, but it didn't have to be perfect because I was covering it. And then I made the aluminum roof material is just 10 thou, and I, um, I marked some strips on it, spaced them out roughly. I didn't know what it was. It, I was looking at pictures, and it's either two or three feet, but I've, it's close enough. Um, and the, the pencil lines are just going to be there for the... Um, the little strips that go in between. I guess it's when I, I have nothing, no idea how uh, a barn is built or how those aluminum roofs work, but I'm sure those, they would roll, it comes in a roll, they unroll it, they tack it to the, the roof, and then they put those strips there as a, um, as a sealant to protect the water. That's what I'm guessing. So those little raised ridges, that's what the lines are for. So I have some guide to go by. So then I, I sheeted with 10,000. I wanted to use 10,000 on here because I knew it would be uneven. And the glue kind of creates some little, uh, some little anomalies on there. And that will, I knew that would help make it look like rust. And it, if you had just done like 20 or 30,000, it would have come out really flat. I wanted some, a little bit of uneven texture too because those aluminum roofs are never perfectly flat. This is where having uh, Lexan scissors really comes in handy because you can cut right through it and, and get a pretty clean edge. That's why I always recommend having that in your toolbox. So here is the 10 thou, and again, I'm just rough cutting. I'm not even measuring it, I'm just going by eye. And I'm cutting um, the little strips that go on the roof. I think there's like a dozen per side or whatever it was. They come out a little curved, but it doesn't matter. What you do is you tack the one end down. I did on the top of the roof, uh, right where the crest is. If you tack that right there and let that dry a bit, it only, this, this glue dries so fast, you're looking at maybe 10, 20 seconds. Then you stretch it down, it'll be straight every time. And again, it, this doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, these roofs aren't perfect. This is an old dilapidated barn, so it's going to be fine. But you can see there in that shot all the, all the mess the roof is from the glue. And, but that's, that's all going to work in my favor once it gets painted. And here it is. It's completed. I've got the doors on, the hinges, the roof is done. It's ready to go to paint. So for paint, I'm using Tamiya and alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, shot through an airbrush. The first one is Tamiya flat black with Tamiya olive green. So it's a subdued um, a muted black with some green in it. And I wanted that because I, I see when I look at old wood, I see green through it because obviously it's a plant. So there's green in it. And I knew it would work in, in, on the roof as well, because the roof will always, aluminum has a kind of a greenish tint to it when it fades anyway. So I really want to get um, a good coat on this. And again, I, I think a lot of people, when they look at things that I've built, they, they automatically assume that the models are, are just lit well. But I'm, I'm creating a highlight and shadow into the model. Um, and this was something that I learned watching uh, Boomer he does this with all his models. He paints everything. So I, I've, I've kind of adapted that method too. And 
because these models are they're so small you don't they don't get the shadow so you've got to paint the shadows in or you don't have to but it does help so the next i use um uh, i think this was whole red and this is going to be the first coat of of rust in this color on the roof and again you don't want to overdo it i i think i i i hit the prime spot here i might have gone a little too heavy you just want some color because you want the you want all the colors to show through that's what creates that that effect and, and that's it i just hit it really quick again this is diluted pretty heavily with isopropyl and i, I like i said i think i overdone it i did it here but I, that's pretty good and that's where i stopped so the next color was a mix that i made with uh tamiya red tamiya orange the whole red and isopropyl and i was going for a lighter rust color so this will get shot over the black and the brown so i'm working my way out and again i'm, I'm trying to create some variance in pattern i don't want to go over the spots that i just did i want to kind of change it up a little bit um, the magic of doing this and you'll see me um, do it a few times here and um, when I do the panels is if you stop shooting paint and you spray air on something that's wet you can actually change the tone so it'll become whiter or lighter shade you can shade with air over uh, the wet to me and alcohol paint and you'll, you'll see me kind of hit that, those spots a couple of times so when you see they get really bright you can see some some spots are darker some spots are lighter I sped this this up for editing purposes, but you can actually change the tone. And that's one of the keys to painting this way. So just blowing air over a spot where you've just saturated with paint will actually change the tone and make a lighter shade of the same paint, which is a really cool trick. And once you start to figure that out, it, it really changes how you do this. And again, I'm, I'm, I, th I feel like I overdid it here you know you get you saw you get that feeling and you're like i should just stop now and it's probably you probably should have stopped before that but again I'm, I'm trying to create some highlights i want some rust to, to show through so i'm pretty much staying between the panels i'm not on those raised ridges because i'm going to come back and hit that with with uh, gray but I want enough, enough rust color here to show through. So originally my plan was to tape off between the ribs and then come back in. But I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wing it. And I'm kind of glad I did. Because I got enough, enough of both colors. And I think right here, so I'm going through. You'll see me uh, sit in some places longer. And um, you can kind of see the highlights now. And then I kind of, I want to go back, like on the left there, there's a big blob, looks like a Q-tip. Um, I kind of want to subdue that. So I think I go back over there and, and hit that a little bit. And you can kind of, you can re, reactivate this and, and mute down uh, and change the tone back down a little bit by saturating an area. You got to be careful though, because you could, you could easily just overdo it. And I'm just trying to go through and, and find spots where I can create some balance. Because you don't want one side or one panel to be too heavy. It's, it, it's never bad, but you kind of want to balance. So if you have a spot that's bright, I, I would change it to an, another area and then, um, and then brighten that up a little bit too. So you, you can kind of bring it out and it won't just be like one. Your eye won't focus on one particular area. So I go back in and add some more. Yeah, see right there, you can kind of see how I start to brighten up some little areas with air. I've painted models my whole life and it really wasn't, you know, until recently when um, I was watching Boomer, he, he just said a lot of things that made sense and 
I don't think I'll ever paint models any other way again. This this method just is exactly what I'm looking for because I want to paint things that look old and weathered anyway. And you can still paint things that look new and shiny with this method, but it works so well for uh, rust and worn out and weathered pieces. It's it's a brilliant method. And then I, I think I go over and just kind of overspray everything to try to blend everything back in. And then the gray was just, uh, to me, a, a reg, I don't remember what kind of gray I used. I, I, I have a bunch of them. Might have been light gray or sky gray or something. I was trying to use something that was closer to white without using white. And I still might go back in and, and give it an overspray of white. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm shooting very, very, very thin paint. So it's mostly um, isopropyl with a little bit of the gray. And I'm very close to what I'm, that rib. And I'm just barely, barely shooting paint out. And, and that's, that's, the whole, that's the whole goal. So I'm going to hit each rib, and I'm not going to really paint anything in the center. Now, if you notice where the black and the brown are, if I do highlight, it's going to be those areas because I want I don't want to cover the spots where I hit the, the, the more orangey rust. So you'll see me come back and fill in some of those spots that are very dark black because I, I, I want to make those more pronounced as a, as a gray color. So I speed it up a little bit, and you can kind of see where I've gone in and, and shaded some of the, those black things. I still want some of that black to show through and, and the brown, but um, I'm more interested in seeing just the gray. And then I'll do a light overspray of, of, of gray on, on the whole thing. But this is kind of where I'm headed. Kind of see where, where I'm going with this. All right. And then same thing on the other side. Uh, weather aluminum is, is, is kind of funky. Um, so you see that spot right there was, was dark. So I'll fill it in a little bit more with gray. Whereas this bright orange spot, I'm gonna, I wanna leave bright and orange below where I'm painting now. Still wanna hit that rib though. And then that's it, just flipped it over, finished the, the bottom end of this. And then just give it all complete overshot of, of gray just to kind of blend everything back in. And that's what I would have done with the tape. I would have basically just shot the ribs. Um, but I, I think this effect actually came out better this way. Give it a little bit of overspray of gray. Make it look like it was all aluminum with some rust. And that's it. That's, that's where I wanted to be. And I'm not worried about overspray on on the, the wood because I'm going to paint that gray as you see here. And yes, a little bit of, of tedious work uh, painting each individual board, but I watched Boomer paint that deck on the barge slip and it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen and I've wanted to do something like that for some time. So this project was the first champ chance that I had to try it and Man, it's 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 really cool. I did have some problem. I think my paint was a little too thick here, because I, at one point my my airbrush starts clogging. I'm not able to get the. Um, I had to stop and clean it. I think I had too much paint. So what I did was I went heavier on the edges, obviously the corners of the um, the building, so I didn't want those to be dark. I wanted those to be a little pronounced, and then I highlighted the boards where the cracks were between them. So the, the places where I had put the boards with the spaces between them, those were the boards that I, I really wanted to highlight because that made the cracks stand out. Had I sprayed, you know, other boards that were together and then, you know, 
those were lighter and were closer to black, then it wouldn't have had the same effect. So I'm going through and I'm hitting all the little boards where the, the cracks are. And I, I do come in here. I, I, at this point, I, I kind of got lost with filming. Um, so I did miss a few things. I did put a few different colors in there. There's a little bit of, of brown in some of these spots. Um, there's a little bit of deck tan. And then I didn't film it, but I, I came back with the olive green that was so diluted with, with isopropyl and just shot it from, from about, I want to say, a foot away. But if I had tried to shoot it, it was, there was so much isopropyl in it that it would have just, it would have started to um, eat through the paint. But it was um, all, the olive green. And it's basically just a filter to tie everything else in. And, and you'll see the effect it had. Sorry, I didn't get to film that. I got myself a little bit lost. So again, just trying to paint, be random with what I'm, what I'm painting with the wood. But man, what a great effect. This was a lot of fun. And this is this is twice the two times speed just to get through this. I mean, this is this is all very tedious, but I want to I think it's important to see the, the effect as as you move on. So that's why I wanted to include this. So but it is sped up. So you can imagine how long this actually took to just do one board. And I also didn't want to hit all the way up on the roof because I want the, the overhang to still have a shadow there. So the boards um, are dark at the tips under the, under the roof just to create that shadow effect. It's funny that I did, I did the back in the back, I think the wood actually looks better than, than the front. Like the back side, because when I mount it, it it's going to be uh, faced. So you'll see the, the front and the right side and the back side and the left side are hidden. You'll still be able to turn the, the model, I guess, but those won't be the pronounced sides to see. And I think those were the two best sides. It was the sides that I, I was trying to, to test things out on. And uh, if I screwed up, then I wouldn't have to uh, screw up the front. But they actually, I think, came up. They look better. So the, the, the doors, I wanted to do a little bit differently than, I didn't want them to match up to the rest of the, the, the boards. Again, get brighter in the corners just to give a definition. I think if I had gone with the, you know, if I hadn't done the, the corners bright, you'd lose that, that sense of square barn. And again, this is, this is time consuming and tedious. And if you're watching this, God bless you, because this is a, a lot of, a lot of stuff to watch, but I think it's important. I think you, you get a sense of, of, of how this process works. But I wanted to leave it in there, but I did speed it up. Otherwise, when I first uh, started editing this, this was was over an hour and a half long, and I've got it down to just a little over, over a half hour. And I could have split it up into two parts, but I, I just wanted to get through it. I will follow up, like I said, with the um, the building of the base. The base will have some detail on it, kind of finish it, make a little scene, a little diorama out of it. Highlight on the corners, finish off the top. I think my paint was getting a little sketchy here. I wasn't able to get um, the flow right. 
but it's fine. I was, you get to that point where the, the, the trigger starts to stick a little bit and you got to put a little bit more pressure and opens up the, um, the paint flow a little bit more. So I was getting a little bit more paint than I wanted, but it's all right. So after this, I came back and I hit everything with another layer. So I kind of randomized some of the things with the brown and, um, and, uh, deck tan, which I think you can see here a little bit. This may have been before I hit it with, with the green. But I was trying to uh, paint the hinges here, I think. So this was going back to the whole red. And it, it's a little bit much at first, when I first break. So again, after an hour plus of... Um, Spraying through the airbrush is starting to get a little bit, little bit wacky, but I, you can come back and clean that up. If you ever do this, it's it's not that bad. Um, I just mixed a little bit of gray and tan, and came back in and just cleaned up where I I had oversprayed it, and then when I sprayed the green green on it, it it cleaned it all up. It was fine, but I wanted the rusty hinges. That was, and I wanted to do it in paint. I didn't want to do it with. Um, with a brush or a wash or, or I mean I could have come back with oils or, or some kind of wash with acrylic or something like that but I really wanted to do it like this I really wanted that effect uh, airbrush does does it it's hard to get that hazy effect with anything else you can create a lot of other great effects but there's like a powdery haze that you can create using this method and um, and an airbrush that you really can't get with anything else so yeah, it's a little bit much here, but again, like I said, I, I subdue it down. You know, it's, we all make mistakes. And this, this, had I had a chance to do it again, I would have definitely cleaned my airbrush and, and got the paint perfect before I had gone back and done this, but it, it worked out. But there's nothing like when you spray that first thing and a big glop comes out and you're like, ah, I've ruined everything after this hard work. Um, I always said, you know, uh, education will, will, will make you good at things. Experience teaches you um, how, to, how to fix mistakes. That's, that's the difference. So that's it. That was that's kind of the look I was going for. Now I had a I had a chance to th think this over after I looked at it. I probably should have put some more detail into the building, um, maybe a window, uh, the door for hay at the top, something like that. I, I thought about it at the beginning, but I just wanted to keep this a simple build, and I'm I'm kind of happy with it. So here's some sloppy pictures of it just sitting on on the tracks at Ogers Park. But I had some good light there, so I figured I would showcase it here first. And I'll, I'll get it to base mounted, take some proper pictures, and, and do a follow-up. Anyway, thanks for watching. Happy building. Grab some styrene. Make something. Y'all have fun. <laughs>